Is that all working? So um, the title of my talk is Atoms and Empty Space. Um, I want to be a little bit provocative with this talk. And the subtitle is How Structural Biology Could Drive Drug Discovery If Only You Would Let It. The quote comes from Democritus of Abdera, the, 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 the father of atomist philosophy, and it's a very stark statement. Nothing exists except atoms and empty space, all else is opinion, and that's pretty much the, the division in my talk. I want to talk a little bit about atoms and empty space and how structural biology can, dry, can, can provide tr tremendous uh, impetus for drug discovery. And at the end, I want to express a couple of, of per perhaps a little radical opinions about how, it, as a technology, it is being massively underused for all sorts of philosophical and, and business reasons rather than scientific reasons. So why is structural biology important? It's a technology that's able to deliver three-dimensional models of, of the complex biological machines that we need to understand if we're going to design and develop uh, effective drugs, be they small molecule, or be, they large, be they protein drugs. It's a technique that enables you, in basic terms, to extract mechanistic principles, how the protein actually works, how it actually does the chemical reaction or the binding or the, or the scaffolding function that it's evolved to have. It enables us, again at a basic level, to understand the evolutionary choices that have shaped biomolecules, how that protein has come about over evolutionary time in order to fulfill that particular function. And then the other two bullet points are far more in the, in the, the translational mode of structural biology, which is able to operate in, in both areas. Structural biology is an incredibly powerful technique for rationalizing the effects of the kind of cancer-associated mutations that Mike was talking about uh, in, 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 his, in his talk, it, it is in the change in the function of the protein that a gain-of-function oncogene activation mutation is actually manifest. And you really cannot understand the significance of those mutations unless you understand their structural context and the effect they have on the mechanistic bio biology, the EGFR receptor mutation, the BRAF E600E being extremely good examples of that. And then finally, there are a means by which we could design, and I use the, design, the word design very explicitly and hopefully provocatively, small molecule drugs, and, 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 and Pache to, to, to Bill Castell, the vast majority of the drugs that are going to be used in the future are going to be small molecules because of the cost of manufacture and, and, and the tremendous selectivity that you can get. But you need to know the structures of the protein targets in order to really design superbly efficacious and, and specific small molecule drugs that are going to alter the behavior of the protein, and particularly in cancer, for example, be, be targeted to, to the, the mutated versions of the proteins. And, and my focus in research is very, very much on cancer, and it's fortuitous that the handle goes through the cancer side on this particular uh, model of the universe rather than the protein. So there's two very defined pipelines in structural biology, the one I would first call the discovery research pipeline. The first phase of this is recombinant expression, and there's been tremendous improvements in technology over, over, over many years. Uh, um, I, I would recommend uh, a, a technology that we developed some years ago called combinatorial domain hunting, which is commercialized by Domainex, who've got a stand out there. I just thought I'd mention that. A recombinant expression is now fairly routine. There are, there are not major, major blockages in this pipeline. Purification of proteins, again, very routine now, very, in parallel, very high throughput, the assembly of more complicated uh, complexes. Many, many, many technologies for analysis, finally driving you out to the primary structural techniques of which X-ray crystallography is the, is the most powerful, and that gets you to the mechanistic biology. So that's the down pipe, if you wish, the discovery research pipe. And then we can invert that, and this is, again, where structural biology has tremendous amount to offer. We can take that mechanistic biology and then working back through X-ray crystallography in particular, use that to really focus drug development, to rationalize a discovery, to rationalize a, a serendipity, but also to really drive the design and thinking about how the drugs, are de how the drugs should be developed uh, as they're improved. And ultimately, of course, the goal of everything we're talking about here is, to do, is patient benefit, to do something about the major diseases uh, that afflict humanity. 
So I thought what I would do for the, the middle bit is just take you through a worked example of one that, that worked, one where that pipeline in both its orientations has really worked, and this is work I've been involved in for, for many years, originally started off at UCL, then for 10 years at the Institute of Cancer Research, and we're continuing this in, in, in Sussex in the MRC Genome Damage and Stability Centre, where my lab currently is. HSP90, I'm sure you've all heard of it. It's a slightly hyped molecule from time to time. It's a molecular chaperone. It's a protein that looks after other proteins. And it's a housekeeping protein, which has always uh, been a little bit of a cloud over it. When, when, when myself and Paul Workman were wandering around drug companies about 10, 15 years ago, trying to persuade them to take this seriously as a target. Association with HSP90, and I'm not going to tell you what, what we think association really means because this talk is far too short to do that, but association with HSP90 is essential for activating a whole set of proteins that we would term client proteins. They depend upon the chaperone for their functionality and stability. And these include a bunch of things, but I really want to focus on the protein kinases and the transcription factors because the ones that have lit up in red will now be very familiar to you. This is, this is a major hit list proteins in any oncology de drug development program in any pharma or biotech uh, company in, in, in the world. And the attractiveness of HSP90 as a target has always been that it actually looks after many of these proteins. And many of these proteins can be shown to be biologically dependent upon a functioning HSP90 for them to exercise their oncogenic potential. And the thought was always, well, rather than trying to shoot each of these individual proteins with the complexity of doing that that Mike has just illustrated, would it be possible instead to target a protein on which very many of these simultaneously divide and therefore achieve some sort of therapeutic effect in tumours in, a, in a, almost a broad spectrum approach to, to a, a targeted but broad spectrum approach to knocking down primarily kinase signaling but also transcription factor signaling in tumours. So HSP90 sits all over cancer. This is you know, I'm sure lots of people are familiar with the, the, the Hanahan and Weinberg concept, the hallmark traits, that a series of mutations has to take place in a perfectly happy cell to produce this metastatic tumour cell that would eventually kill you. And these include developing self-sufficient growth signals driven by BRAF, AKT, other kinases. Whoops. Just too sensitive. <laughs> And then the, the ignoring anti-growth signals, ignoring program death, overriding limits on replication, developing an independent blood supply, vascular neogenesis, and then the, meta, the metastatic phenotype invasion. And many, many of these processes are absolutely dependent on these proteins here, all of which are themselves absolutely dependent on HSP90 for their function and cellular stability. So there's a, a, a tremendous rationale behind this. The discovery part of this, which came from my laboratory quite a long time ago now, horrified to see how long ago, was that HSP90 is actually an ATP-driven protein. This was very contentious at the time, but resolved by the structural biology. The structural biology showing ATP, though in this case it's lost a phosphate, it's just ADP, bound to a domain in the protein, absolutely settled the argument that HSP90 is an ATP-driven protein. And, uh, and a lot, the binding site for that ATP is extremely unusual. It was not recognized pre previously because it's very unusual. It's full of water. And again, from the point of view of a medicinal chemist or, or somebody wanting to, to think about drugs that would compete with this ATP, this kind of water-filled site is, is an absolute playground for the development of new molecules that can take advantage of all of the, the space and all of the interactions in that site. The ATP drives a conformational cycle in the protein, and this is illustrated here on, on the right. 